it. Welcome to this conversation about the abortion rights in Poland. This is a seminar with activists, organizations, and elected representatives from Sweden and Poland, like a, a panel full of women. Um, some of you I met during this week, uh, but I'm really, really happy that we now can talk about this really important conversation together in this way. I will do like a short presentation round of all of you. And when I say your names, you can like do way so people know who you are. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna start with um, Amy Waliszewska, a queer activist for human rights and publisher from Poland. Welcome. Uh, we also have with us Malin Björk, a parliamentarian from the European Union for the left party in Sweden. We have Jutta Kavalerovic uh, representing Rasen, which is the left party in Poland. We also have with us Hanna Gedin, uh, the deputy party secretary of the left party. Hi, Hanna. And we have Kasia Moleda, former Polish consul and uh, journalist and sociologist. We have Julia Terpinska, founder of Polish Women on Strike Sweden. Hello. And we have like Ada Jurash, a co-founder of Polish Women on Strike Sweden. And also with yeah. us, we have Katarina Wahlgren, a group leader for the Swedish left party at Stockholm Regional Parliament. My name is Elena Karlström and I will try to moderate. Uh, and I'm also the, the chairperson of the left party in, for the Stockholm region. Uh, I'm thinking we're gonna start with you, Hanna Gidding, to give a short introduction. Yes, thank you. I would like to start to say that I'm very grateful to have this seminar and uh, the panel which aims at learning from what is happening in our neighboring country, Poland, and hopefully we will gain some experience that could be of, of importance in our common struggle. Last weekend, the Swedish left party held its 43rd party congress and uh, during that Congress, we collected money, uh, money for the purpose of funding the Polish struggle against strict abortion laws and for the right of Polish women to decide over their own bodies. So why is this an important question for the Swedish left party? Well, because what is happening right now in Poland is something that actually affects us all in Sweden as well. It is about fundamental human rights and solidarity with women all over the world. And you know, 70 years ago, when Sweden had very strict abortion laws, uh, Swedish women actually went to Poland. They traveled to Poland in order to do abortion. And today we want to return that favor of solidarity and sisterhood to the Polish women and show what then they gave us. But of course, it's also a question, um, an important question for us because it's a question that is deeply connected to what we see as an international movement of right-wing extremism and authoritarian politics that is spreading right now, like a pandemic. It is a political force that is gaining power in many European countries, but also in a large part of the world. Uh, the US, for example, they did not only vote about the president. In some states, they actually voted on whether to restrict abortion rights or not. So the threats against women's rights to safe abortions are closely connected to other threats against human rights, the rights to asylum and protection from war and oppression, and the right to be allowed to love whoever you want, regardless of sex. And in the European Parliament, the Swedish Left Party uh, is part of this struggle for the right to legal and safe abortions. And our member of the European Parliament, Malin Björk, who is present here today, uh, is one of the key figures in this struggle, deeply committed to the cause. Our right to decide over our own bodies is threatened in Poland and all over the world. And we have, in this sense, a common cause. We stand united. 
But I think in order to be able to do that, we need to get to know each other and to learn from uh, the different strugg struggles all over the world. So today I really want to listen to, to our Polish friends and learn more about the situation and what is happening right now in Poland. And I hope that we will be able to discuss how to counter these attacks on our bodies. So I'm very, very pleased that you're all here today, and I really look forward to this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'm really happy that you said that because I'm just going to say it one, one, one more time. <laughs> um, when we're doing these kind of conversations, like the politicians from the left party, we are like more a listening role in this type of conversations. Um, I just want to, to, to say that again. Um, now I'm going to let uh, Jutta uh, tell us, give us a short summary. Okay, um, so hi and uh, again uh, warm thanks to our Swedish allies and friends for letting us have this conversation and letting you inform what's happening in, uh, in Poland. Uh, many of you might have seen the pictures from Warsaw, where over 1,000 people gathered uh, and protested in a very large uh, mass protest, uh, one of the largest that we had after, after the fall of communism. Um, it's important to highlight that it's not just the capital city that's protesting, but people and women are uh, gathering in pretty much every single town. And, um, and just, just saying how very fed up they are. This is even more striking because in Poland, as you know, um, we have ongoing pandemic situation. It's, uh, it's, it's very bad. It's picking up the speed. Um, so why are people gathering in such huge numbers during a pandemic? Um, so uh, women are very, very angry. Um, Poland already had had one of the strictest abortion law in um, Europe, uh, next to uh, Malta, and in the world. Uh, abortion, legal abortion, was uh, permitted only in three. So abortion is generally uh, not not legal in Poland. It's permitted in three very narrow cases: in case where uh, pregnancy was a result of uh, rape or incest, uh, when when woman's life is endangered by pregnancy, and the thirdly, when there is uh, there is severe and uh, irreversible damage to the fetus. And what has happened is that this third um, third uh, possibility was taken away. Um, so women can no longer terminate pregnancy on the grounds of severe and irrever irreversible damage to the fetus. What made people even more upset, uh, angry, furious, to be honest, is that this was introduced by the back door. Uh, so in the, by the so-called uh, constitutional tribunal, which is, to be honest, it's a politicized law and justice tribunal, uh, pretty much the situation that you have in the US where, you know, in the Supreme Court, uh, people were placed in a way that is, you know, it's disputable whether it's legal or not to make certain judgments. And um, the idea of uh, ban abortion uh, in case of severe and irreversible damage to the fetus has been going around for a while. It was an electoral promise by law and justice to, uh, to Catholic Church, uh, who frankly uh, supported them uh, during electoral campaign, and also to some extremist groups uh, such as Ordo Iuris, uh, which is very active in, uh, in internationally and which has been unfortunately very successful in Poland. Um, you know, they have their people in Ministry of Justice, they're very influential right now. So law and justice that they will, uh, they will uh, take away this uh, third possibility. They tried it in 2016, if you remember the so-called umbrella black strike, where there was loads and loads of women with umbrellas going on uh, at the protest, also in small cities in the capital. Um, then they back down and they back down because that was, uh, they tried to do it as it should be in the parliament. So they had parliamentary debates. Uh, there was this proposal, there was a counter proposal from the left uh, to actually make abortion legal up to 12 weeks. Um, 
and they backed down because they frankly did not expect this scale of the of the process um yes but they did not forget about this they they just wanted to introduce it by the back door uh in this political by the politicized constitutional tribunal uh, who ruled that uh, this uh, this third promise is uh stands in uh, it's 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 against the polish constitution um and this is the situation we are facing today uh, just to highlight uh, access to abortion in poland is already uh very very narrow to legal abortion there's just over 1000 cases uh, of legal abortion so uh, even before 2020 we are talking about um, severe restriction to reproductive uh, healthcare services. Um, so this is the context in which we work. And to make the situation even worse, to make Polish women even more furious, you know, uh, the ruling party did not uh, try to show any compassion, understanding, but you know what they did is actually to make the situation even uh, even more difficult. Um, because uh, they had uh, the, the Jarosław Kaczyński, who's uh, the de facto leader, the de facto dictator in the country, uh, the leader of uh, uh, Law and Justice Party, uh, made this uh, surreal address to the nation, frankly, in which he called all members of Law and Justice and all people of the goodwill to go and protect Catholic churches. Because Catholic churches, as you can imagine, uh, uh, women also did go and protest uh, in front of the churches, sometimes in the churches, because they really go uh, into our private lives. So why should we not go in churches? That was the logic. Um, so, you know, there was a call to pr protect our Catholic churches, which resulted, frankly, in uh, just far right militia going around hunting for women, beating women uh, on the streets, beating the protesters, uh, where the police force was sent to uh, protect, you know, governmental buildings, the buildings where uh, where governmental officials live, and also Catholic churches. So this is the situation we have right now. Um, it seems that they that they uh, hesitate a little bit about when to publish this ruling, but the consequence is already there. Uh, the few hospitals which terminated pregnancies. Uh, they said that they cannot uh, no longer carry out terminations because they are uncertain of the situation. Women uh, who had scheduled their terminations uh, this week, last week, were sent back, uh, were refused terminations um, and frankly left with nothing. They, they just have to arrange it them, themselves. Uh, yes, seek, uh, seek help, uh, you know, with, 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 with their own accord. Um, so yeah, so this is this is where we stand, and uh, it's quite it's 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 very upsetting the situation. It's been um, changing rapidly. We're in a situation where uh, you know where we see this uh, fundamentalist organization holding conference conferences about whether they should maybe outlaw uh, divorces. Uh, where we see um, uh, so very influential organizations like Ordo Juris, you know, they discuss whether divorce is a good idea. We are in a situation where consciousness clause, so this uh, this uh, situation where a, a doctor or a pharmacist can refuse uh, services, can refuse abortion, is also applied to access to contraception. So uh, you know, a situation where you go, uh, you seek uh, uh, contraception or emergency contraception. And a pharmacist can just send you because this is against uh, his or uh, her religious beliefs and nothing can be done to them. No consequences can be taken out. Um, yes, so thank you. This is where we stand today. We are going to talk more about the context, how we got to this point, because, you know, it really reversed. It really reversed. We are not we, we are in a very difficult, different position uh, some years ago. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I will uh, give Kasia the word because you have a short background history for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yuta, for this introduction. Thank you, Elena. Uh, yes, it, uh, it never happens from one day to another. It's usually a process and it was a process too because what is happening now is the result of what happened in 1993. Until 1993, 
uh, under so-called communism in Poland, it was free access to abortion. Women, if they needed, they could uh, do abortion. It was uh, called abortion for social considerations. So if you have a situation uh, in which you felt you don't want to have children, you could terminate the pregnancy. In 1993, the law changed. And uh, we have to remember that this law, very strict law, as Yuta said, only three cases in which the pregnancy can be terminated, uh, was uh, actually uh, ruled by the parliament uh, with the liberal and left majority. And uh, this, uh, these parties that were in parliament, not everybody voted for this, but, the, but uh, uh, many enough to, for the law to pass, they actually did exactly what the Catholic Church wanted them to do. Uh, and uh, at this point of time, most of Poles were for, for the right for, uh, to abortion. So, but they were not asked about their opinion. The decision was made without participation, without the democratic protest, without uh, social research checking what the results could be. And uh, the results were actually quite striking. Um, I will tell you uh, about it uh, in a while and I will show you a slide. Uh, but what was the most bizarre thing was that it was sold to the public as a compromise, a compromise, but in fact, it was a total, total submission to Catholic Church. And what was the result of this so-called compromise? Um, I will share the screen and I will show you the, the result. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the compromise uh, ended up in the situation in which we went from 150,000 legal registered abortions per year. That was the statistic, uh, statistics uh, before 1993 to about 500 per year. So uh, then it was a little bit more. And as Utah said, nowadays we have around 1,000 per year. 98% of those uh, abortions are because uh, there is some impairment in the fetus. Uh, but after this law passed, uh, the subject of abortion was not present in main debate or in media. You couldn't, in the mainstream, you couldn't hear any criticism. It was not regarded worth talking about it. And the language, if those subjects were discussed at all, also changed. Instead of abortion or fetus, uh, all of a sudden uh, people started using expressions like unborn children, killing of unborn children. And this expression compromise, it was repeated in different contexts. And at the end, very many people uh, like not Poles who maybe does not know, do not know what was behind started using this without reflecting, using this expression compromise. And the change of the language uh, resulted in changes of attitudes, the changes in the minds. So if you have a look at opinion pol polls in Poland, in 1993, as I said, most Poles were for right for abortion, but the tendency was, uh, was that more and more people were against. So if we look at the opinion polls in 2016, there were much more people that were against right to abortion than those who were for right to abortion. But this is actually an uh, important date, as Utah said, uh, in 2016, the government tried to introduce a total ban on abortion, and uh, it was uh, met by massive uh, protests. And if we look at the polls, it was the first year of the different trend. The number of people who are for free abortion started rising, and it rises uh, until today. 
And if we ask people, there are some pools, maybe they are not perfect because it has gone such a short time. But if you ask people, even those who support law and justice, if they are for these changes that were made right, that are made right now, they are not. Most people between, depending on the pool, between 65 to 84% are against it. So this is where we are now regarding public opinion and the attitudes. Yes, thank you so much. I'm thinking we're, I'm gonna ask around here. Um, um, I'm after your reflections. I know you're active in so many different ways, some in the parliaments and uh, some are activists. So, so uh, just say, well, well, I know you're active here in Stockholm also in so many different ways. So, and also in the, in the Brussels where Malin is. So some reflection on what's happening right now in Poland here, or maybe in Stockholm, uh, some reflection about what the movement are doing, maybe some reflection about what does this ruling of the constitutional tribunal means for Polish women? And what can we expect from the government? What more can we expect from the government church um, uh, or courts to counter these protests? So I'm just, uh, you can um, uh, take which one of these questions, but I'm gonna start with Amy, your, refle your reflections. Uh, yeah, it was uh, really nice to hear uh, Tasha's perspective. Thank you for that. Like I also would like to focus more on it that, yeah, it's uh, it definitely has been a process. Um, it's like after 93, we still had kind of not very right-wing um, government or like very central uh, stuff were start happening uh, around 2005 where one more of those very conservative very uh, religious parties went to government mm, and since then we could observe like a few patterns so uh, it will be like on one side like the uh, like demonizing abortion, feminism, but also uh, gay people. Uh, and over the years, uh, since they were going like, um, they were gaining power uh, till today, uh, the enemy would change. So that could be um, also like um, refugees, that would be a big part because uh, they would scared, uh, scare people that, um, that refugees will, will um, be a threat to Polish women and to Catholicism. So uh, last years they focused mostly on uh, on gay people uh, in Poland, uh, and uh, now we can see like how it kind of like a snowball effect happened to this moment with the abortion uh, because people were protesting. Um, during those like last couple of years, uh, in uh, in August, um, there were like a lot of protests in Poland, also in Sweden and other countries, about arresting um, an activist Margot because um, she was um, destroying the um, how do they call it uh, trucks that were spreading information like um, that gay people are pedophiles, that sexual education is about teaching children how to masturbate, uh, and also about abortion, that abortion is um, uh, like proceed on basically like uh, not fetuses on embryos, but the pictures that were showing it was basically uh, a few months old uh, children. Um, so yeah, uh, Margo got arrested uh, for destroying one of the track from blocking the track with uh, rest of the people from the um, group called Stop Zurom, which is translated to Stop the Nonsense. Uh, she was held for two months uh, in arrest uh, that was highly like against any like human rights and rules. Uh, it, it like it was as a like not restriction, but uh, it was in a form of uh, keeping a person away uh, from committing more crimes, but it was like a political activist thing. So uh, it wasn't any problem that the person would be a danger to society. Uh, then we got uh, some coverage, some people, uh, but still since for years, um, 
uh, law and justice were keeping this like um, outcome that like gay people are uh, are just sick, are uh, are having mental problems, or pedophiles. We didn't have that much coverage. Uh, now they actually started to um, hit against more of the population, have the population that uh, uh, that means like people with uterus. Uh, and then people actually start raising, uh, showing their anger because um, stuff like went too quickly uh, into the wrong direction. So uh, those people that were protesting over the years, uh, that be a queer community, feminist community, uh, actually gather uh, people around the Poland that usually are not very political because they re realize that um, it's not only about all oh, like this minorities, uh, but also about like um, most of the people's like surrounding families uh, and stuff like that. Which also is uh, interesting to mention is how the church in Poland uh, is like a very connected like in a business wise and political wise. Uh, Catholic church in Poland doesn't pay taxes um, and um, we can observe a lot of situations when um, churches like high, uh, high um, people like in the church uh, structures um, are holding uh, a lot of assets, a lot of monies. Uh, they're creating like public companies. Uh, and we could see like the mutual businesses uh, between parties and that we can see what church at the moment is supporting. For example, church at, the, at this moment is supporting um, uh, is supporting um, farms, uh, like uh, far farms uh, with minxes, uh, which usually it wasn't a bit of a concern of Catholic Church, but now since there's a lot of uh, business going on with that, uh, they're very standing like for farmers or uh, for uh, ritual, um, ritual butchery uh, with kosher and haral meat, although it's not, uh, totally like uh, there is uh, not a big amount of people that actually uh, needs kosher or halal meat. So we are the biggest exporters. So we can see church going like hand to hand with politicians and their businesses. Um, so it's way much, much like broader than just the abortion law. We can just see like a big control uh, of the country um, by Catholic church. Thank you. Uh, and I'm thinking, Julia, welcome. Maybe you're tired from yesterday. <laughs> Some reflections. Yeah, I was actually quite tired after yesterday, but I think now I'm good. About um, what I wanted to add from my part is uh, how increasingly, uh, in, in like how much the anti-choice uh, organization in Poland are uh, they are gaining more influence uh, in the public scene and uh, since they were established in 2013 uh, they have been clearly engaging themselves more in the political scene and also uh, their board members have been um, incorporated in many uh, jurisdiction like le legal legal institutions and um well the the institutions that um, implement uh well any jurisdictional changes and i think that Utah touched on most of the things i wanted to mention but um well it is important to say that uh, ordo juris which is the main uh, anti-choice organization in poland uh it has some clear alliances with um organizations uh, in the US, uh, other European organizations and uh, Brazilian organizations as well. Uh, some of them are Alliance Defending Freedom or uh, Tradition, Family and, Pro and Property or the US Christian Legal Army. And um, well, the most striking thing about this organization is probably that they are not very clear about their their financing there are no public statements about who is uh, who are the donors uh, or yeah there's just no no clear no clarity about uh, the financial background of the organization and uh, therefore we cannot clearly um, point out any particular well 
uh, broader goal of the organ organization, even though they are pursuing their objectives of um, they are pursuing their, their objectives of uh, protection of life, which is their main part at the moment. And uh, they are protecting life specifically from conception to natural birth. And um, well, the narrative about that has, well, they have, they're mirroring the uh, narrative of, um, I would say of many climate activists as well, which is not maybe as, Obvious, but uh, in their uh, in one of the documents called Agenda Europe, uh, they are mentioning that uh, well that there is a clear timely deadline of ten to twenty years to prevent changes, uh, which is similar to uh, the Paris Agreement, and uh, they are also saying that uh, well that the consequences of so-called uh, well, feminist ideology or uh, any type of pro-abortion, pro-choice um, movements is uh, having consequences on the next generations that uh, they are, uh, well, that irreparable self-destruction would happen even if no action was taken, but they are encouraging local and large scale actions. And uh, they are even mentioning, mentioning the end of human civilization in the prism of moral values. So uh, they are having some clear moral backup in their actions. Um, and this is qu well quite a well-constructed agenda because human dignity, and morality, uh, and what they are calling as the restoration of natural law, they are very subjective and broad concepts that can be uh, interpreted in different ways. And uh, since their organization is uh, structured mainly, or they are uh, composed mainly of well-educated lawyers, they have the resources to manipulate the public opinion based on the laws that are currently incorporated uh, in the constitution or other legal acts in Poland. Um, so in this sense, they are pretty much, uh, well, they are pretty much compromising the control of, uh, well, the woman's control of her own body and her own freedom to choose over the uh, control of the, well, they are claiming to be controlling the life of the unborn child. Uh, well, yeah, and in this sense, they are also changing the narrative saying that by protecting the unborn life, they are protecting the natural law and uh, people who would, let, who would prefer to, the people who would prefer to uh, like fight for the uh, control of the, uh, well, women's, Females con women's control of their own body, uh, they are called e egoist and uh, ideological. Um, well, and then in the broader concept, they are also uh, the they are also fighting for or striving towards uh, protection of family, and this includes the uh, patriarchal uh, heterosexual family consisting of a man, a female, and a woman, and the ch and children specifically. Uh, and in this sense, they were really active in the uh, protests that Amanda mentioned, that, or Amy mentioned, uh, when they were advocating against uh, any uh, anti-discrimination uh, education in Poland, for example. Um, and lastly, they, uh, they are part of, well, their agenda is uh, grounded in what is called religious freedom, which uh, strives for, well, religious values, religious morals being essentially um, taken out of the uh, legislation, any legislations on hate speech or um, of any discrimination and uh, provision of services. So this would result in any public discussion statements in which they would be uh, openly promoting hate towards minorities as not a crime uh, in, in le legally in Poland. Uh, so this is the broader con uh, 
context of the uh, organization or the URIs. Yeah, the last thing I would like to mention is that uh, their, well, their values or their statement is that uh, morality and uh, protection of life, protection of family, the religious freedom, they are not what, well, the current liberal world would call it as uh, subjective values, but they are claiming them to be the objective truths. And because they are objective truths, they have to be implemented in legal acts and they have to be enforced on the population. And that uh, goes against any well values of uh, democracy of uh, liberty uh, of choice and uh, speech it was quite chaotic but i hope that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um thank you julia uh i'm going to turn to molly because i know you have to go around two and maybe we will take 15 minutes over time. So Marlene, I'm going to turn to you from your re reflection in the European Union. Uh, thank you, Elena. But I think we have time to hear from Ada uh, first, maybe. So we have all our Polish uh, uh, colleagues to, to be able to, to express. And then I will just very shortly say what we're trying to do in the European Parliament. So that's fine with me. I have until two, no problem. Yeah. Well, then we, then we go to Ada. And I, I was also thinking about your reflections because uh, you're and Julia are the co founder of this Polish, uh, Polish women's strike here in Sweden. Um, I was in one of your demonstrations a while ago. Can you let us know? It was, yeah. How, how do you feel like a Polish woman here in Sweden? And, you know, it's, this is all going on over there. Can you tell us some how it is? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this discussion. Uh, I, uh, I'm really glad to see that it's uh, female dominated. It's not a common view in Poland. So <laughs> great job with that. Um, my uh, colleagues were talking about uh, the background, uh, both historical and sociological. Uh, but I would like to focus more on consequences of this law and actually the current state of the situation in Poland. Uh, so, and also our goals as uh, the Polish uh, Women on Strike Sweden. Uh, so first of all, uh, yesterday I looked up the statistics uh, from the uh, Ministry of Healthcare in Poland. And as Jutta mentioned, we are talking about a problem which is uh, uh, very small, in fact, comparing to uh, the number of citizens in our country. In 2019, only 1,100 abortions were undergone in Poland, and 96% of them uh, were conducted because of the fetus defects. It means that currently the ruling party is dragging people out on the streets in the uh, middle of pandemic, where uh, yesterday the number of infected people reached almost 25,000, just to force this 1,000 women in a scale of 30 8 million people country uh, to uh, force them to carry a defected child in their bodies until the children or fetuses will die. Uh, I think all my friends from uh, Polish Women on Strike and also you will agree uh, that um, this law should never be implemented. And I'm very happy to see that our protests um, are uh, so popular here, here in Stockholm. Uh, by now, we conducted three protests, uh, one on Friday, directly after, um, uh, after uh, introducing the new law, uh, then the next one, the biggest one, uh, on Wednesday. And uh, actually, uh, this protest was uh, the biggest protest of um, Polish people here in Sweden since uh, imposing the martial law. So this is quite a big achievement. And I'm happy that we get some coverage in media uh, and um, also uh, that we get the support from the parties here in Sweden. Uh, but uh, our goal is um, not uh, only to protest and scream in front of embassy and trying to communicate with the ambassador, which should represent us, and she doesn't. Um, but uh, we uh, want to receive support from Swedish government, that is our main goal, because uh, 
you know, empty slogans, it won't change anything. Uh, but um, we managed to, over the last two weeks, we managed to create a like, pretty big uh, network and actually have a say uh, in the government with the Milia Paket. Uh, so uh, we are really counting uh, on positive result in that. Yesterday, officially, um, we uh, appealed to uh, the Swedish government um, uh, to condemn the decision of restriction, the uh, abortion, uh, new abortion law in Poland, as well as uh, allowing Polish women to have a free abortion here in Sweden. And uh, we hope that soon the Swedish uh, government um, will uh, comment on that. Uh, but as I told you, I think uh, what is also important um, to mention is that um, this is not just an empty law. There are like serious consequences uh, and this is already happening in Poland. And uh, these cases are um, very famous, infamous, so to say, uh, but uh, most of them uh, ended up in Brussels, uh, in European Parliament, and Polish women were winning with Poland. Uh, there are two particular cases uh, that I would like to mention. Uh, the first one uh, has its grounds in what uh, Jutta and Julia were talking about. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the problems uh, that we have with Catholic Church, uh, and this is the uh, Polish Dr. Uh, Hazan case. Uh, so uh, just a quick uh, background, um, a Polish doctor refused uh, on faith grounds to perform an abortion on a woman uh, who has been carrying um, uh, the uh, uh, defected fetus and uh, she was uh, forced uh, to give birth. And uh, as an example on how does it actually look like in Poland, I can um, uh, quote an article uh, in which uh, a person who was asked for opinion about this case was the uh, Warsaw's Roman Catholic Archbishop, Cardinal Kazimierz Nitsch. And uh, he says about this medical case uh, that it is a dangerous precedent that violates the rights, not just of Catholics, but of everyone. So that I can, uh, you can imagine how the situation looks like in Poland if, um, a person uh, who is being asked about a medical opinion on a case that should be very simple is the archbishop. Uh, that's one of the cases I would like to uh, talk about. And the second one is, uh, is uh, another very famous case. Uh, it's Alicia Tysiądz um, uh, versus Poland, uh, which she won. But the question is, what was the cost of this win. So uh, this woman had uh, very serious uh, eyesight problems and she was informed that if she's going to be forced to give birth one more time, she already had two children, she's going to get blind. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I read an interview with her yesterday. Uh, she lost her eyesight. She cannot see uh, on a distance longer than one and a half meters. She's not able to work. She's not able to take care of her children. Uh, I think we should remember these two names uh, when we talk about abortion and when we ask for support from the government, because we need to realize that uh, forbidding abortion has serious consequences on human lives. Uh, and as a Polish woman, I can say that uh, it breaks my heart that uh, a Swedish woman, woman's life or health would be saved, a German's woman, uh, life would be saved, but my sisters from Poland would die or lose, lose their health in case uh, this situation happens. So that's my reflection over it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ida. Um, so I'm going to Martin. So what's going on in the European Union? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, especially to all our Polish uh, colleagues and comrades that, that are actually doing these uh, mobilizations in Sweden and in Poland. Uh, we are trying, uh, at least our promise from, 
from our side from the Swedish left party, whether we are in the in the national parliament in, or the local ones, as in Stockholm and and in um, uh, uh, or in the European Parliament, is to to be a, a place where you can uh, a voice that you can count on to pick up on these fights. But they are, you know, we always know and we are always in contact with colleagues of of yours, whether uh, here in Sweden, but also of course in Poland, to be able to to react timely and so that it's really supportive actions that we do. And I can just say uh, shortly that that as said was said by Elena and and Hanna from our side, it, this is this is an international struggle, uh, and uh, for better and for worse. I mean, in, in terms of Poland, has become a little bit of the epicenter of, of this struggle uh, in Europe uh, because of of this developments. And I think uh, the second point is that uh, uh, the the um, the way that the link between democracy and rule of law on the one hand and uh, fundamental rights, women's rights, uh, the, the way that they are interdependent becomes so clear with this constitutional court ruling. I don't think it, you know, I don't think it, it, it can become clearer than that. Uh, PIS is gradually controlling the system of justice and then, uh, then this, this uh, strategy is very uh, is used by the anti-choice uh, people to challenge uh, uh, women's rights to our bodies. So uh, these movements, they are organized, they have different order euros, is a very big actor also internationally. Uh, and they are, as was said by Julia and others, they have these international networks, they have American funding. There was a big article about that the other week, how they are actually uh, profiting from, from lots of funding streams from the US. That see that these are actors that they want to, to promote in Europe and they do different strategy, strategies in different countries where they see they can, before it was a lot of referendums to, to get into the constitutions. Uh, against gay marriage and and also to save life from the conception movement of conception and things like that so that we have in different european constitutions now that can be used of course uh, this way and now they're trying to use the constitutional courts they also are extremely uh, mobilized when it comes to sexuality education in schools uh, but they will use what they can and they have different strategies to intervene in different countries uh, but I do think that the developments in, in Poland, uh, there is a reaction now uh, as, as that is building up. And just to be very concrete, we have asked uh, together with other progressive uh, forces in the European Parliament to have a debate. We will get it this month of November. Uh, not this, we have a small session of the, of the plenary in, uh, now next week, but we didn't manage to get it because, of course, PIS blocked that. So we will have it uh, in, uh, later, but this November, we will have a debate with the resolution and any input to that I would like to share with you and to get your uh, views on what needs to be in that resolution. Uh, we also have been planning to travel to Poland. The COVID corona situation also, of course, makes this very difficult, but don't hesitate to call upon us when it's, when it's timely and when you think it's possible for us to come and that it doesn't, you know, it's not used against the mobilization, but it's actually supportive. Uh, and we are discussing that, uh, different parliamentarians, uh, how we could, in a safe way, of course, then travel with, with doing these PCR tests, etc. Uh, as Hanna mentioned, we had our, I, I, we have to also recognize that, that different organizations and civil society are extremely under pressure both in terms of that courts uh, are being mobilized against them. <laughs> uh, there uh, are, uh, you know, the, the funding is being cut uh, and people are being attacked and harassed. So we have to be very vigilant uh, uh, in terms of on, at political level to safeguard and to be to uh, to make sure that we uh, keep uh, supporting civil society and activists mobilization. Uh, I think also to, to be very clear about, uh, we also have a commitment from, from our side for long-term uh, um, relationship of solidarity. We might not be able to change this overnight, uh, despite these great mobilizations. So we have the relationship we have with our sister party, with Razem, we have with women's movement, we have the LGBTI community in Poland. And these are things that we're, we, we, we will stick into this fight together. We will stick into this fight together. And you have allies uh, uh, in, in the left group in the European Parliament. You, we have also other progressive forces that we, of course, are working with. And, and uh, you always have our ear and our support. Uh, in terms of the, the demands that was made to the Swedish 
level, I will uh, ask Katarina and Hanna to, of course, to, to, uh, to answer to that. But it is clear to, to us that it would be, I, I think the, uh, the one cannot underestimate also now, like the political reaction coming from different governments and including, of course, the Swedish one, that is political support. And then also uh, if there could be concrete support in terms of how to organize. Uh, uh, abortion care for Polish women in different countries, Germany, Sweden, of course, you know, to see how we can, can that would be a very, uh, I think, very nice gesture also relating to the history we've had where not only Swedish women went to Poland, French women went to Poland, many women around Europe went to Poland and got the abortion care that they needed. So, um, uh, I just want to say that I'm very happy that, that uh, I could be with you today and I, uh, we are with you also uh, all the other days uh, of the year. So please stay in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molin. Thank you for being here. I know you have a lot to do around two. Um, I will go to uh, Katarina. How, how is it in Sweden or maybe more in Stockholm? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we having our struggles about safe abortion because we have this privatization of care, which sometimes um, gets uh, some unserious um, uh, doctors to uh, be in the game. But um, I think we have a safe abortion for Swedish women and uh, also since 2008 it's possible for foreign women to come to Sweden and have an abortion. Uh, what we uh, are thinking of is, is it possible, it, are there costs or are there other arrangements that, that has to be done uh, to make it possible for Polish women women to come to Sweden and then I mean uh, especially of course uh, to Stockholm as uh, we are uh, in charge of Stockholm here uh, so uh, much of this panel I have listened to you and your stories and it's uh, terrible and it's a terrible development which uh, doesn't uh, just uh, going on in Poland it's going on in other countries and uh, there are also voices in Sweden of limiting the right to abortion so we need to stick together in this and uh, I really like to uh, you to uh, tell me what can we do in Stockholm what can we do to help you, to support you? We can support you with words, but are there other concrete things that we can do so that uh, we will work for then? Yes, Ida. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katarina, for pointing out uh, this practical side uh, of, uh, of this solution, because, uh, as you said, we need to undertake the real actions. And that's kind of my attitude as well uh, when it comes to solving problems. Uh, so uh, I hear your voice and I would like to tell you something. Uh, it is uh, probably impossible to imagine for you here in Sweden, but uh, there are Polish families that live for 3000 crowns per month families, not single people, families. Uh, for these people, uh, traveling uh, to Sweden, it is a big cost. They need to find accommodation, uh, apart from paying for undergoing the abortion, they need to pay for the plane tickets. Now it's uh, even more limited because, the, because of the strict uh, restrictions, um, uh, yeah, because of the restrictions um, related to coronavirus. Uh, but uh, I just want to uh, tell you that uh, this thing is already happening. I mean, uh, early abortion is um, like we are using pills for that, like uh, they don't need any kind of surgery. So uh, the cost is not high. This cost of help is not high. And this is uh, like despite the fact that uh, some women need to pay for the abortion, even the ones uh, uh, with insurance uh, here in Sweden. Uh, 
actually we know about clinics and hospitals here uh, that are helping Polish women for free. So uh, there is a goodwill in people and that's why we are addressing you with this appeal to help us because we know it's pass possible because we know it's happening but we need clear procedure and a clear message. That's, uh, that's what we would like to receive from you. Thank you. If Thank I you. I also, also Amy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if I could add something to that, as uh, Ada said, like, yeah, like Poland is um, a very poor country among the other European countries. Uh, so, like, simply like the subway ticket is something that people are left by a few days probably in Poland. Um, but that's a, one of the problem. And the problem is that in Poland, people with money will have abortion um, because they can afford to travel to Slovenia, to, to Czech Republic, to Germany or to Sweden. Uh, the problem, uh, as Ada said, is uh, when it's about um, people with a low income. Uh, and yes, yeah, since we can have a medical abortion, uh, but that's only a case in um, a very early stage of pregnancy, uh, in case that right now, uh, for example, some uh, changes with the fetus or, or um, women's health, uh, which is still allowed, but uh, it's very from the doctor to doctor because they still have this like causal of conscious that they might say no to it. Um, then it's a problem because then it's a need of surgical um, abortion. Uh, of the procedure. Uh, what I think like uh, money wise, as Ada said, there's a lot of good people that would like to probably uh, raise money for this cause. Uh, but what Sweden can do directly is um, allow people without personal number to have an easy access uh, to have uh, like um, uh, a person who could speak in Polish or English uh, on the telephone with them. Uh, and who could help them with the process because this is, I think, the most problematic part of it that um, the healthcare in Sweden, it is very um, connected with having a personal number, with having the place you're staying. So having another like a infrastructure for that uh, would be very needed. Um, adding on to that, I just want to briefly say that even though there are some clinics which provide free abortion for Polish women in Sweden, uh, it is not clearly communicated. And since abortion is such a timely procedure, uh, it would be really appreciated if politicians could also have a statement about that, that, uh, well, Polish women can feel safe going to Sweden, that, will, that they will not be denied abortion. And uh, yeah, that they can perform it here. Yeah, also like a clear message um, in a pro like European Union or something that like Sweden like welcomes Polish people to, to come because that's something that like um, people when they're in need of abortion, they don't really have time for a clear research uh, what country allows on what st uh, standards. So having this message, um, like on a European um, a stage, that, that would be very helpful. Mm. I'm gonna ask uh, Jutta and Kasia, maybe you really, really short, one of you or maybe both can answer on this question about, now we have this ban on abortion um, from, the, from the right wing extremists, uh, but what, what is like the next step? What other rights are threatened? When, when, when we have this uh, reactionary gain. So what can we see next? Yes, I was mentioning that um, it's not just women. It's, uh, I mean, 50% of Poland's population, but they've been going after uh, LGBT plus community. Um, you know, uh, as Amy said, refugees. Um, it's frankly, uh, you know, the whole lot of issues that they that is connected to uh, a restriction on women's uh, rights. But as I mentioned, you know, the problem is the consciousness clause that uh, doctors can hide behind this and deny access to healthcare services. Uh, so, you know, if you need an um, emergency contraception, it's very important to get it timely. You never know whether you're gonna knock on doctor's door and they're gonna send you with nothing. Um, 
Yeah, and I mean, as, as, as a kind of maybe like politically impactful, uh, very concrete uh, measure, you know, there are women who were sent from one day to another who had their termination scheduled in these days in the hospital that was performing them. Uh, we exist in legal void right now because doctors don't know, frankly, if they can perform abortions uh, uh, to in cases of severe uh, defects to the fetus. If you invited, it's not a lot of people, but if Sweden invited those people who were sent, this woman who were sent from one day to another, I mean, imagine the amount of horror in their lives. Uh, it's it's not a lot of people very, very politically impactful. I think this statement of you left this woman out from one day to another, you left it in legal void, you know, uh, law, uh, to, it's, 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 it's not what a country, a lawful country should do. So that's that's my idea of a very concrete uh, and I think doable measure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. As, uh, I agree totally. You have already mentioned the LGBTQ rights that are violated right now in Poland, but even other human rights, right to feel safe in my own home, domestic violence, for example, uh, our <laughs> government does not see it as a problem. They refuse to undersign international conventions on domestic violence. And of course, it's not only Poland, because it's, it's, it's not only problem of Poland. And it may seem, even if the, we can say that there is only a sea between Poland and Sweden, so we are neighbors in some sense, but it may seem for Swedish people quite far away. Nevertheless, for example, this consciousness objection, the right for a doctor or medical personnel to refuse to do abortion, it was not a question in Sweden for 15, 10 years ago. It showed up some years ago and it was discussion about it. So those tendencies are seen everywhere. And what I am worried about is also this taking over language which I already mentioned. For example, the abortion uh, uh, cause we are talking about right now is that a woman has uh, abortion because of the irreversible uh, abnormalities in the fetus. But in Poland, many people call it eugenics abortion, which of course uh, <laughs> makes it to be associated with uh, some eugenic practices from the past or Nazi practices even. So we, uh, and the same in Sweden, if you say immigration and crime in one sentence all the time, it makes the impact. So I think we have to own the language, both in Sweden and in Poland, regarding women's rights, human's rights. We have to make our voices heard by using the language that people will use and don't let those right-wing extreme forces to own the language. We have to own it. We have to make people to understand it. Thank you, because we had a question in, in Facebook and I'm gonna actually take it now. Um, it says like, what have been good contra, what have been good strategies from the side of the feminist and the, all the progressive movement right now in Poland? Um, what kind of uh, actions has been like, successful and what kind of rhetorics is like, what, what, do, what can you give us some tip? What, what, what can you say about this? Strategies. Do you mean linguistic strategies? Yeah, anything. I know like you have, um, I was amazed when we were on the demonstration when you have like this, um, no, like the overhead and stuff like that on, on the building. Um, you also, um, you have this like uh, the symbol, the flash, for example. Um, you have uh, a lot of things. Um, can you tell us something about about the flash? What, what what does it mean? Does someone knows? Give us a background story. You mean the Polish uh, women on strike symbol? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I mean, I think uh, I think the reason why uh, Polish women on strike was so successful is the fact that um, uh, I mean, like even from like marketing point of view, um, and uh, I mean, like uh, you know, we uh, we share the same symbols. They are uh, very um, 
very simple. Everyone has it at home. I mean, for example, the story of umbrella uh, and uh, this uh, this slogan that like we don't put away our umbrellas. It came from a very simple fact that it was raining on that day. So uh, the impression uh, of that was amazing because there was almost like one million people on the streets. Everyone was carrying an umbrella, uh, and that's what everyone remembers. Uh, I mean, these uh, colors of uh, Polish women on strike, uh, black and red, uh, this has been also like a very uh, easily um, visually recognizable. Um, and um, also they gathered uh, a big community uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, so uh, I think that's, uh, except of course of the cause that we are working for, but uh, these uh, these kind of things uh, made this protest so successful. Um, I must say, I was also surprised that in uh, a little bit over one week, we managed to gather 5,000 people here in Stockholm. This is a very big uh, part of a Polish community and uh, people rarely engage because, uh, I mean, they have everything they need in Sweden and that's why uh, they move, move out from Poland. That's why they um, emigrated because uh, we value uh, solidarity, we value democracy, we value respect of human rights, and that's what we find here. Uh, but still, when you experience um, uh, this kind of immigration, like it's not only physically, it's also mentally. So you always uh, stay, as we say in Poland, with one leg in your previous country. So we, um, yes, I, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know any Polish person right now that doesn't care of what is happening in Poland, even though we are safe in every sense here. And we get so much support from the government, so much support from the police. So um, I think mm -hmm. that's that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I may add something. Actually, yes. you are describing exactly what I can uh, what I can call a strategy. Uh, of building uh, on the values that we share, because as I said, nowadays there are even uh, uh, there are even supporters of law and justice that are protesting. So there are very different groups, very very strange uh, strange groups that may seem like uh, farmers sometimes are joining or bus drivers are joining. So there are ven very many groups that have very different opinions, various opinions on different subjects, but they have something that they that unites them. And I think this is actually a good strategy to get to use this momentum that so many people are against this thing, which is horrible for almost everyone in Poland. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to ask you the last question. We have been in it in some way, but what kind of pressures and help can be offered by our international allies? What are you I think it's like, as mentioned before, um, like internationally, it's, uh, it's a clear message. It's, uh, I would also say it's, uh, it's important that internationally people will um, call out law and justice and Polish government. Um, that I think is very important because Polish government feels like untouchable. Uh, feels very protected by church and stuff. Uh, they are saying a lot of stuff against European Union. At the same time, taking a lot of money uh, from for all the projects in European Union without uh, actually respecting uh, values of European Union. So there is the bias. Uh, some projects were cancelled. Some donations, dotations were cancelled. Um, but maybe it's not enough. Maybe uh, it's important to actually like uh, on the European level to call out Poland and uh, and see that more and more stuff are bad, that people are um, privileged enough still because uh, like we are ha we're happy that we are still in European Union so we can travel that that's make a difference for us than for example um, for other newcomers uh, from other um, places in the world, uh, we had an easy access to move to Sweden. Uh, but we also are not sure how long it's gonna last, how long Poland will uh, want to stay in European Union, how long the European Union would like us there as well. Uh, so this call out will be very, very important. Uh, and among other parts, like um, encouraging uh, Polish people to like high 
in this country, we gonna help you with abortion or we can like uh, help you send uh, abortion pills and stuff like that. So that's, I think what internationally people can do at the moment. Mm. And I'm um, thinking, um, yeah. It should be a continuous action that foreign media and uh, foreign politicians should not forget what has happened in Poland, even though the publishment of the sentence was delayed. It is not constitutional to delay uh, the publishment of such sentence. And it just proves how much dependent the constitutional tribunal is on the uh, ruling party. But we need constant support. We need constant attention so that the party is, or the party and the constitutional, constitutional tribunal are constantly called on what they're doing called out. Yeah. Yes, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, and uh, like my last appeal is actually don't let this discussion die because it's already happening. Uh, I mean, we have the election in the US, uh, but at the same time uh, in, your, um, uh, in your medias, you are forgetting about something that is geographically and culturally much closer, uh, which is uh, the country on the other side of the Baltic Sea. So uh, just please don't let this discussion die. Uh, we understand, like we are realistic here. We understand that uh, the health budget is closed, that there are more challenges right now because like we are in the middle of the world pandemic. Uh, but still what we are asking for are clear procedures and condemning uh, the actions of the Polish government. Thank you. Uh, okay. I could also add that uh, we would very appreciate like uh, any kind of legal support because um, yeah, they tried to put the same law like ban the abortion four years ago, uh, didn't happen. So they went through the highest court. Uh, and the problem is that for now, this decision is very hard to reverse because it's not like we are not allowing abortion. They just said that the law that says uh, we are allowed to terminate, uh, terminate pregnancy while the fetus has some kind of um, defects uh, is unconstitutional. And constitutional in Poland is like the highest uh, rule book that all the other laws have to apply to. So by this statement from the highest court, right now, uh, probably the only way to change it is to change the constitution, which is a very hard process. Uh, and you also said before, like what might happen uh, next? Like, yeah, the momentum we have now that it's uh, something that impacts so many people in Poland, it gives us a lot of strength, but this is not gonna be the end because uh, as we said before, there are gonna be uh, minorities, there are gonna be people of color, people of different religions, uh, there are gonna be LGBTQ people that are gonna be, um, still haunted and they will not have as many supporters as now the abortion law has so we need constant like support uh, in legal ways to be able to um also protect some people uh recently we're starting thinking about possibility of having asylums for uh lgbtq people or people of color uh, from poland because they are not safe in poland Thank you. I'm gonna give the word to you and Kasia for the last, um, and maybe Hannah Gideen, really after those. <laughs> so do you have some last comments, you and Kasia? I very shortly can say something optimistic because I yeah. think it was uh, a little bit gloomy and that's right, because it's not a good situation. But what is optimistic that uh, both our president and law and justice are losing in opinion polls. And this is for the first time in a long time that they are actually going down. So from around 40, depending on the poll, 36% uh, for law and justice, now they are on the level of 26%. So it's between 15 and 10% uh, going down within uh, like one month. So it's huge. So let's see how it will develop, uh, how it will develop later. Mm, I love future. your optimism, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> at the same time, I also know that um, we, we don't have a strong opposition because other pa parties that are like 
raising and uh, and support they will not change that they're also very catholic uh what's sad about it the leftist uh parties they are not raising support at all uh so yeah as all the people have a problem right now with law and justice we still have a party that's called confederation and yeah the confederation that we can like uh think about us uh they are like highly nationalist party uh, very xenophobic, um, with very, very strong opinions about uh, a lot of like human rights, uh, but they're also saying stuff like um, um, that they want people to have like low taxes, uh, free market, uh, so people are going there. So I, I would like to be as optimistic, but at the same time, I know that the change that might be just the name of the party. Those people might just go to, to different places. So without like a huge change in the government and the changing of people uh, and, and the way that they're elected uh, will not happen, we will still, uh, we'll still face those problems. But we still, we have now left parties in the parliament, so they have more power than they have before the election, and we have Razem, so there are people who are fighting. I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, if how it will develop. I agree with you that the situation is uh, is very difficult right now. That's why we are meeting here and talking and trying to change it. Mm-hmm. Yes, but you have to sorry, yeah. I just have to say something quickly. Sorry for interrupting. But I, I have to agree with Amy that uh, I'm also not very optimistic because I just want to remind you that they won a presidential election uh, after conducting a political arrest of LGBT activists. They won the election after stealing 70 million for the election that never happened. Uh, they won the election after uh, doing some very shady businesses with selling masks and uh, just getting rich on that. So I don't think. I don't think there is honestly anything that can stop them without international pressure, because in Poland, our hands are tied. Hmm. I'm thinking, Jutta, you are from the Polish left. <laughs> Some last word. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? I mean, we will be, we will be uh, doing, uh, um, we will be collecting signatures for a policy proposal. But again, I mean, you know, you have to have the majority to pass uh, proposals that will, for instance, we want to legalize abortion up to week 12, like it is not in normal European countries. Um, the next election is in three years, and we have time to build this, uh, you know, this networks to talk, to change the language to, you know, we don't want to go back to compromise. Let's talk about this loudly and clearly, you know, that compromise, uh, it's not a compromise, it's a compromitation. And, that uh, we want to go, uh, we want to have the same rights as, uh, as women in other European countries. I think this gives us, it's, it's, it's a long struggle, I agree, uh, but you know, we have three years to the next election, we can change it. I mean, international pressures is very important, you know, just consider that all the Yuris lost their premises in Brussels, you know, because in Brussels, uh, people find out what they do and they say, oh, we cannot hire premises to a group like this and they lost it so it's it's one score another score you know Yuria Przemska which is the head of the politicized constitutional tribunal uh, she uh, dropped this bomb and went into hiding in her comfortable villa in Berlin but you know uh, Polish activists went after her they started giving leaflets explaining to her neighbors what she did in Poland to the restaurant when she dies fine restaurant, you know, it's name and shame. It's, it's uh, in, in, in Western European countries, this is getting some, and she had to, uh, uh, she had to leave her villa. Um, this is gaining some support. And yeah, let's, let's, let's keep the struggle. Let, let's not get divided. Let's try to, you know, focus on our common objective. Uh, we have three years to go. Thank you. So, Hannah. You didn't. You have some thoughts about this conversation. Yeah, some thoughts, maybe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, all of you. I mean, this has been not just an important talk, I think, but also a lot of Im- important things have been said. Things that I didn't know, for example, and I think the people listening as well didn't know. Uh, I do agree that it is a depressing de- development and not only depressing, I mean, as you mentioned, this is uh, in many cases 
a question about life and death for women. So it's very, very concrete. And um, of course, it's difficult being optimistic in that kind of situation. At the same time, I think that's the on the positive side, this force, the actually the solidarity that that exists between women, between countries, between movements, that is something to, I mean, to um, deepen and to work, uh, build th things around. And I can promise you that we will stay in solidarity from, from the left party in Sweden with the movement in Poland. Uh, I would also like to say that the extreme right wing uh, they have been uh, in times in power before, earlier. They have had, I mean, uh, a lot of power and gained terrain, but they have also lost because of movements from people. So in that way, it's, in, in, in my point of view, uh, a necessity that we keep on fighting because they will lose in the end. And we will do that together. And... Um, the proposals that you put forward during this discussion, I will uh, bring them to my, uh, put them forward to my, uh, to, not to my, but to the parliamentarians in, in the left party and see how we can act and in what way. So that was a very important uh, thing that you said. I would really like to thank you from the part of the left party um, for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanna, and thank you all for sitting here like maybe one and a half hours soon. Uh, it, we have a long way, but we are with you. Uh, the, what, what you said, uh, we won't, uh, we will still have up our umbrellas with you. Uh, and we will not let this question die here in Sweden or in other countries nearby. So, so we will stay in touch. Maybe we'll have an, another panel like this. In, in, in a while, um, the struggle will continue. You're not alone, yeah. And we will take all of these questions to our parliaments so we can put the pressure on, on, the, on the international way, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank so, you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I will hear from, I, I will, bye, mm -hmm. thank bye you. Bye-bye, bye-bye, thank bye. you.